And I hope that uh, together in this worship service, we'll be able to give glory uh, to the name of God and Christ our Savior. So let us just pray as we begin our worship service. Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for this time. Um, thank you for this privilege that in the middle of the week, uh, you've given us this grace to call us as worshipers. The Lord, we may come before you to worship your holy name and to also once again sit under the preaching and the, and, and the reading of your word, uh, reminding us of who we are, our true identity, the Lord, uh, we have that we are children of God uh, that, have called, that are called and set apart uh, for your name and uh, for your glory and for your greatness, Lord. Therefore, this time, Lord, as we worship you, Lord, may you remind us that um, uh, this is why you've called us. This is why, Lord, you've saved us. And I pray the Lord through us, you may be glorified and be exalted uh, this evening for the God. We have come together, Lord, um, knowing that um, uh, we, this is only possible because of, of Christ and what he has done for us, O oh God. For without him, uh, we have nothing to do with you, Lord. And therefore, Lord, we want to thank you for this wonderful grace of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And I pray that, Lord, in this time, as we worship your holy name, that once again, Lord, we'll be reminded of what he has done on the cross of Calvary for us, that only in his righteousness, Lord, we are able to come before you. And therefore, Lord, we want to confess all our sins once again as we approach your throne of grace, uh, knowing and having this assurance of, Lord, if we confess our sins, are you faithful to forgive us? And once again, to restore us into your grace of salvation, Lord. May you truly wash us, Lord, in the blood of Christ, uh, sanctify us in the word of God, and also may you sanctify us in the Holy Spirit. And I pray the Lord even today, as we listen to your word, because you sanctify us uh, through your word, Lord, uh, help us to be able to open our ears and hear your word of Father God. Help us to be able, Lord, to understand your word. Uh, give us wisdom, give us understanding, Lord. Illumine our hearts, Lord, that through your word, we may be sanctified even more and be able, Lord, to even... Uh, worship and glorify your holy name. I pray that, Lord, especially that may give grace to your servant, uh, Peter Shield, today, Lord, even as he brings forth your word, the Lord through him, uh, that once again may be glorified, and that once again the church will be able to be edified uh, within uh, the teachings uh, of your word this evening. We give you all the glory and praise, and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Our first hymn is A Wonderful Savior is Jesus our Lord. Uh, sorry, uh, what a friend we have in Jesus. That's the first one. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Come but with the Lord of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do your friends despise forsake you? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms still take and shield you. You will find us all as Let's confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Oh. One, sorry, I'm gonna start with the lower um, pitch than that. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hid my soul in the cliff to the road where rivers of pleasure I see. He hid my soul in the cleft of the rock, the shadows are dry, dusty light. He hid my life in the depths of his love, and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. The shadows are bright as the land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessing each moment he crowns and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a redeemer as mine. He heedeth my soul in the cleft of the rock, the shadows are bright as the light. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with a millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. The shadows are dry, dusty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Amen. Uh, the passage for today's message this evening comes from the book of Mark, chapter 1. The book of Mark, chapter 1, 
from verse 29 to verse 45. I'll read the word of God in Mark chapter 1, verse 29 to verse 45. The word of God says, And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling, said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for approved to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could, not, could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in the desolate places, and the people were coming to him from every quarter. Amen. And just as I um, mentioned earlier in the beginning, <clears throat> uh, Peter, as my friend and my brother, um, and also my co-worker, I would say that we preach the gospel together uh, many times. Um, and he'll tell us maybe a little bit about his ministry. He's also a church planter. Um, the 116 Bible Church, Birmingham is the one that he's planting uh, just uh, in, within the area of uh, Starbridge. That's where the church plant is. Um, and uh, I've known him for about, about two years now, um, had very many great fellowships and very many great uh, times ministering together and reaching out to the lost here in Birmingham. Um, it got, the Lord is using him greatly, and I believe uh, through this uh, friendship and uh, you know, brotherhood, we'll continue to uh, see many works of God uh, taking place here in Birmingham. But we're going to witness that, that the Lord really is saving the lost here in the city. And also um, the evidence of that thing uh, in our uh, ministry. So uh, I'm really glad that today uh, he's joined us. Um, we've been waiting for this moment for a long time. So I'm very happy personally uh, that today we're able to worship with him. And uh, most importantly, that he's bringing us the word of God uh, today. So, uh, Peter, just um, uh, yeah, carry on and uh, yeah, um, glory to God. And thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Maurice. It's a, <clears throat> a real privilege um, to be uh, to be here with you this evening. Um, yeah, it's uh, wonderful to uh, uh, get connected and to be able to come and to share from God's word. Uh, with Birmingham Presbyterian Church, and as Maurice has mentioned, um, yeah, we've uh, <clears throat> I've known Maurice probably for yeah over, over certainly over a year now, maybe coming up two years, maybe I think, um, and it's been a yeah wonderful um, privilege to get to know you, brother, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to uh, get to know you more as the years go on, and if the Lord wills, do ministry together uh, out on the streets. Um, can I just check? Can you hear me? Okay, Maurice. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, it's, it's all good. Yes, very good. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, thanks, brother. 
Yeah, so um, <clears throat> yeah, let's uh, let's look into our, our text, shall we, for uh, for this evening? Um, we'll uh, we'll just uh, make a start with our sermon with the message this evening. Uh, Mark chapter one, as Maurice has, has read, I'll be uh, kind of preaching out of the New King James version uh, here this this evening. Um, Mark chapter one. So here we are at uh, the beginning of Mark. Uh, Mark's gospel, the very fast paced. Uh, gospel Mark um, uh, was a disciple of, uh, of Peter and there's lots of um, very intricate details in the book of Mark it's a uh, it's a book which very much describes the, the the character of Jesus Christ the person of Jesus Christ we see his, uh, his messianic mission really beginning to take place here in Mark chapter one <clears throat> and uh, yeah uh, in the other synoptics we have um kind of genealogies and the birth of jesus and mary and joseph and those kind of um those kind of uh, narratives and in the gospel of john we see this kind of theological understanding concerning jesus being the word in the beginning uh, and he was with god and he was god and he became flesh and dwelt amongst us but uh, the gospel of mark is kind of unique in some ways it really jumps straight into the mission of jesus starting with john the baptist uh, proclaiming, uh, prepare the way of the Lord. Uh, Jesus comes into his ministry. Uh, we haven't read it yet this evening, but we see uh, Jesus coming and being baptized by John, uh, going off into the wilderness and um, <clears throat> being tempted by, by Satan and then coming out of this temptation and beginning to proclaim the kingdom. If you've got your Bibles with you, uh, we see in verse 15 this uh, message of, of the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Now repent and believe the gospel. And then he calls the, the first uh, disciples. We see uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John, these fishers, uh, these fishers of fish, uh, are called to be fishers of men by Jesus. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He goes into the synagogue on the, on the, the, the Jewish uh, Sabbath, which was the Shabbat, and he, um, he casts out the demon. We see that from verses 21 through to verses 28, and then he goes back to Peter's house, and that's where we arrive at today. Jesus going into Peter's house at some point on the on the Saturday following his his ministry in the in the synagogue in Capernaum. And Jesus is there, and we see this uh, this healing of uh, of Simon Peter's uh, mother-in-law. She had a fever; she was sick with a fever. We see this healing. And then we, um, we see this uh, almost like a, a division between our sections this, this, this afternoon, this evening. We see this, um, this work of the Lord as, as men and women from Capernaum bring, bring their sick and the demonic possessed would come to the, to the door of, Simon's, uh, of Simon Peter's house. And it says that Jesus uh, he healed, he healed many in verse 34, then he healed many who were sick with various diseases. Here's Jesus coming into the darkness. We see this picture of darkness in verse 32. It says it was evening time. So um, obviously these men and women were, were Jewish. They would have waited for, for the sunset on the Saturday to bring their, uh, their infirm and to come to the house of this one who's just uh, demonstrated this power in the synagogue where he's cast out this demon. And now here he is. It says, Interestingly, in our text, um, uh, verse 32, at evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. Verse 33, the whole city was gathered together at the door. The whole city, imagine that, Capernaum is this small town. Um, historians believe that there would have been about maybe 1,500 people that lived in Capernaum back in those days. So imagine the amount of people, I mean, instead of the whole city here, the, the amount of people that would have come um, to this house, uh, Peter's house, uh, just to seek this one who is work, work, uh, working and walking in power. And Jesus is ushering in his kingdom. The kingdom of light is coming into the kingdom of darkness and the demons have to flee. And, 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 and the healings take place and miraculous is taking place. And it's really proving that... Um, that the Messiah is here. The Messiah is here. <clears throat> so let us just think about our text this evening for a moment. We have these these um, 
these works of power by Christ, these works, that, these miraculous works in between two miracles, really. And that's the miracle of Peter's mother-in-law being healed of her fever and the miracle of this man with leprosy being cleansed by Christ. Now, we, all, we, we must always tread carefully when we, when we uh, use these um, accounts and we try to draw out a particular principle from these accounts. Uh, but when we think of Peter's mother-in-law and we think of the leper, what we see here really is a picture of sin. And this is the first, the first point I just want to talk about this evening. And that is the, the, the disease which, is, which we are in need of, of, of cleansing, the disease which, in, which needs to be cleansed, which, which we are in need of cleansing. We have this, uh, this man with leprosy. He comes to Jesus and he said, Lord, if you are willing, and Jesus says, I am willing, be cleansed. We see this man with this, um, this disease of leprosy. Now, leprosy uh, in the modern day world around us, there are various medications that can be taken. There are, there are things that can be done in order to uh, um, halt the process of leprosy, the damage that it can do to the body. But, you know, 2,000 years ago, leprosy was a, was a very damning and, de and, and, and um, a very, uh, an illness that was very, very uh, destructive towards an individual's life. If you had leprosy 2,000 years ago, then you would be in big trouble. You, you would be outcast from society. You would um, be considered unclean by the people of God. You would uh, be financially uh, potentially not able to, to provide for your family. You would be ostracized, not, not, not to mention um, the actual physical implications of leprosy. We think we're talking about uh, fingers and toes uh, decaying and, and rotting and rotting flesh falling away uh, from the body. A very, a very um, destructive illness, an illness which is very tragic, a very tragic disease indeed. We're just, um, obviously, we're experiencing this kind of global pandemic at the moment, uh, social isolation, people being asked to stay at home and give each other distance. But, you know, a lepr someone with leprosy um, back in the ancient days uh, would have been uh, kept at a, a great distance from people, even when they would approach the their, their friends or those in the street, they would say, unclean, get back, get back. And what we see here, again, not wanting to make too big of a jump here, but what we see here really is a picture of sin. We see a picture of sin. When we think of this leprosy upon this individual, we think of the, the disease of sin that all, all mankind really has, the disease of sin that affects all human beings from the cradle to the grave. Every human being that is born into this, into this world is diseased, in a sense, in their sin before God. Now, in, with, that, with lepers, with people with leprosy in ancient times, they would often, they would often use a cloth in order to wrap around their sores. So if their arm had leprosy, they would wrap the cloth around their arms and they would try to contain the illness. So I, I heard a preacher once talking about how he used to work with people uh, with leprosy and a, a leper of the worst kind. If there was a leper in, in your church and you were going to church one day, you would actually smell the, the leper before you got into the building. This worst kind of leprosy where the, 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 the sores would be putrefied and, and, and the cloth that would be around the wounds of the person with leprosy would, be, would just become... Um, ailed and it would just become damaged and it would fall away and the only thing they could do was just try and cover the sores up with more cloth they would take more cloth and they would cover these sores and then the, the, the cloth would become uh, destroyed and putrefied and they would cover it with more cloth and you know that's that's kind of a picture for us of sin we have sin as human beings we're born into a condition of sin and we often try to cover our sin with our righteousness, don't we? We often try to, to make up for our sin by uh, doing good things, by doing good deeds, by uh, doing acts of righteous works. And we look at the false religious systems around us today, we, we consider at the moment it's, um, it's Ramadan for the religion of Islam and the various other religions that are, that are doing various things. But this idea of, of Ramadan, they, they, 
a try to fast in order to earn God's favor, to complete the five, one of the five pillars of Islam. And, and really, it's the same, the same situation across all self-righteous religion. And that's man's uh, attempt to try and bandage up the wounds of sin, trying to cover over sin. But, you know, covering sin with our good deeds is never going to save us. It's never going to heal us before God. Now, I just want us to consider another, another picture, and that's the picture of uh, Peter's mother-in-law. Um, as we go back, just a few verses from verses 20, 29 to 31. And she was sick with a fever. She was sick with a fever. And Jesus came to her in verse uh, 31, and he took her by the hand and he lifted her up. And immediately the fever left. Now we know again this illustration isn't it's not a not a perfect one for the point that, that we're trying to make here, but we see a lady who's complete, completely incapable of getting of getting up. She's she she needs to be helped up by the Savior. Now we know she wasn't dead at this time, but we know we see examples in the in the gospels of Jesus coming and raising people from the dead of bringing dead men and dead young, young girls to life. And this is really the, the main issue. And, this, and that is that we as human beings are spiritually dead in sin. We're dead in sin. You see, we have sin. We have this kind of uh, spiritual leprosy that affects us externally. But the reason that we have this external spiritual leprosy is because we are internally dead in sin. The Bible says we are conceived in sin. We're born into sin. We're born with a sinful nature. There's, a, there's an expression that, um, that I heard once. We're, we're not sinners because we sin, but we sin because we're sinners by nature. You don't have to teach children to do, to do that which is wrong. You have to teach them to do that which is right because we have this sin nature. We're, the Bible says in Ephesians that we are dead in trespasses and sin. So when we walk around the streets, we go out with the gospel, we see people who are physically alive, but if they're outside of Jesus Christ, they are, they are spiritually dead in sin and they're incapable of saving themselves. Now, I heard an illustration once, with, with, once which talked about the principle, uh, the idea of salvation would be um, something like a, a, a rescue boat going out into the sea. And, and people throwing a rescue line into the water where there's men and women that are drowning. And these men and women uh, grab hold of the rope so that they can be pulled onto, onto the boat. Now, that's a very interesting illustration, but it's not a complete picture of salvation. You see, the picture of salvation that we see in Scripture would be the rescue boat going out into the water, but actually men and women not being drowning in the, in the sea trying to grab hold of ropes, but men and women being dead at the bottom of the ocean. And then that rescue of pulling the dead person out of the sea and reviving them and bringing them back to life. This is the picture we see in Scripture, that God, in his mercy, saves a dead sinner and brings them to life. That, that life is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come, said Jesus, that you may have life and life more abundantly. So do we recognize that around us? Do we, as we, as we um, <clears throat> well, if we're believers here this evening, we should have experienced this life that God gives, this genuine work of his spirit within us where we, our affections have changed, our heart is is, is been made new before him. We're born again, as the scriptures speak about. But we also must recognize that this is the issue with man, the whole of mankind. Mankind is in need of being given this new life. And only God can give that life as the gospel goes uh, in his means, as the church goes with the gospel and proclaims this truth. And it is the truth that sets a person free. So we've seen this first point, the, the disease that is in need of cleansing, and that is the disease of sin. Now, secondly, I just want us to consider the Savior, the second point, the Savior who is willing, the Savior who is willing. <clears throat> in our, in our um, text this evening, 
If you turn with me to verse 40, we'll just read the account of this leper. It says, now the leper came to him, that's to Jesus, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and he touched him, and he said, I am willing, be cleansed, be cleansed. I am willing, be cleansed. Now, I just want, to, just want us to focus for a few, a few minutes on this principle of, of the willingness of Jesus, the willingness of God. Now, as I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm theologically, I would be what they call um, a reformed. I'm not really keen on labels, but really, in essence, what that boils down to is that God, we believe the scriptures speak that God is sovereign over salvation, that God has called and chosen his people from eternity past. Uh, it is something uh, which God does in the hearts of of a man, it's not a 50-50 part, partnership, but it is fully a work of God. And here's the thing, if we're not careful in reformed circles, we can almost present God in the wrong way. Yes, it is true that God is, reform that, that God is sovereign, that God is in control of salvation, that he is the one who saves uh, the elect, that he has chosen from eternity past. But we must recognize also the twin truth of scripture that God is willing to save, that Jesus Christ is willing to cleanse his people. It's not, that, it's not that God is unwilling, but God is willing to save men and women. For example, we know Jesus himself. He, he, he said, um, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, how, 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 how long I have uh, wanted to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, you would not come because you were not willing. Now, I know there's a dispensational context to that particular verse, but the reality is it's not that Jesus is not willing to save. We should never paint God in a, in a light where we, where we preach him or we, we speak about him as being someone who's not willing to save people because he is willing to save. But the problem is that mankind is not willing to come to him. Mankind is not willing to, to lay down their sin. They're slaves to sin in their natural condition. Human beings are slaves to sin, just like we were once were. But we were set free. Those of us here this evening who are Christians have been set free to serve God. The Bible says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. See, Jesus Christ is willing to come and to save. And, and do we think that when we're sharing the gospel with our loved ones, with our family, do we recognize that God is willing to save these people? It's not, they won't go to hell because God was unwilling, but men and women go to hell because of their sin. God is holding his arms of grace uh, open to these men and women, and he's calling to them to come to me. Come to me, he says, all those of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, Jesus Christ is willing. He is the willing Savior. The Bible speaks about how the Lord is merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in mercy and love. That God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, and, but shall have eternal life. You see, sometimes in Reformed circles, we, we paint God out in a certain way that he's not. God is so willing to say that he came into this creation in his son Jesus, the man, Christ Jesus, fully God and fully man. And he lived that perfect life. And then he went to his pre-planned death of Calvary's cross, where he was beaten, and he was bruised, and he was blooded, and he was mocked by Roman soldiers. They mocked him. They put a crown of thorns in his head. They put a, 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 a kingly robe upon him to mock him. And then he was dragged through the street, and he dragged his cross to the place of the skull, Golgotha, and he was nailed to this cross. 
and Jesus Christ was crucified publicly, hanging there before men. And as he, as he hung before heaven and earth, representing God to man and man to God, this one mediator who stands between us and the Father, this one mediator who, who, who intercedes for us, this, this Christ who died at Calvary's cross, he cried out, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus Christ took the judgment and the penalty and the punishment of God the Father that we deserve, the punishment that should fall upon us as sinners, fell upon Jesus Christ in our place. You see, folks, like friends, Jesus is willing. He is willing to save his people. He was willing to cleanse this leper. And he is the one who we must come before and we must trust in. So he is willing and he is able. Jesus Christ is able. Let's turn back to our text this evening. We see here in the text. So in verse 35, this was after the evening of miracles, Jesus doing these mighty works as the Messiah, delivering the demoniacs and healing the sick. Now he goes to, I mean, imagine what that would have been like. That would have been a very busy evening of ministry. You're talking about potentially a thousand plus people coming to the door of Peter's house and Jesus being involved in these mighty signs and wonders and these messianic miracles that are effectively um, validating who he is and what this message uh, that he's preaching was that it was truthful, that it was pointing to who he was and what he'd come to do. But here we see the next morning in verse 35. It says, now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. So we see this, we see this picture here of Jesus, this picture here of Jesus. We see these, um, we see these verbs that are used here in this particular section. It says that he uh, rose a uh, long while before daylight. He went out, he departed, he prayed. We see this action that was taken by Christ. He took action to go and to seek his father's will. He came and he, 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 he was one who walked within the will of his father. Not only was he one who is willing, but he is one who is able. He is one who is more than able. He was one who drew his power from Father, from the Holy Spirit. We, we often um, speak of the deity of Christ. We speak about how Jesus is God, and that is all completely true. And yes, and amen, that is such a wonderful reality that Jesus is divine and eternal in, in, his, uh, in, his, in his deity. But often we neglect, uh, very often within Christian circles, we, we, we neglect to recognize that he lived as a, as a full, yes, fully God, but also as fully man, that he conducted his ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. We see this uh, in just a few verses before in the book of Mark, the, the baptism of Christ and the Holy Spirit uh, anointing Christ for ministry. And you see, Jesus uh, sought his Father's will. He was one who was always obeying his Father's will. He was one that has fulfilled the righteousness he, he completed and achieved, attained the righteousness that none of us can attain. He, he had the righteousness that, the righteousness that none of us have in our, own, in our own selves. You see, Jesus Christ never, never did that which he shouldn't do, and he always did that which he should do. Jesus Christ, the righteous Lamb of God. The Bible says he was, he was tempted as we are in all ways, yet he was without sin. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, he who knew no sin was made to be sin so that we can become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ came on a mission to go to the cross. We see that he was tempted in the wilderness by the devil, but he was one who resisted temptation. He was one who, who perfected that perfect righteousness in his life. Every cup of water he ever drunk, was to, to, was to the glory of his father. Every word he ever spoke was, to, was in obedience to his father's will. He obeyed his father actively 
by what he did, the things he did and the things he didn't do, but he also obeyed his father passively. He obeyed his father, he obeyed his father completely and he is completely able. You see, this is something we need to recognize as, as Christians, as those who are looking unto Jesus. See, being a Christian is more than just having your sins forgiven. It's more than just Jesus atoning for your sin. See, if, 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 if your requirement for being a friend of God was just that you're just having your sins forgiven, you still haven't got the righteousness which is required for heaven. We still haven't got the righteousness which is needed for friendship with God. You see, we need a righteousness that's not, that's not our own righteousness. And that is what is given to us. It's what's known in this, uh, theologically as the divine exchange. Not only does Jesus take our sin upon himself at the cross, and we, and we receive uh, that, that justification, we receive that, 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 um, that atoning work by faith. Not only does he take our sin, but his righteousness is credited to us. We receive his righteousness. We're clothed in the righteous, obedient robes of Jesus. So when we die and we meet our creator, God doesn't see us in our sin and who we are, but he sees Christ. He sees us clothed in the righteousness and the, the perfect, spotless obedience of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is willing and Jesus Christ was, is able. He is able to save because he's the perfect one who obeyed his father's will and went to that cross and take, took the, the penalty in the place of those who would come to him and trust him. So just as we come to a close, uh, just a few, uh, another point really, another point to finish on. We see the disease that is in need of cleansing, the disease of sin. We've spoken about the Savior who is willing. But let us just for a few moments consider the King, the King who we must yield to, the King who we must yield to. This idea of yielding means to, uh, to, to bow the knee, it's a sense of handing over all that we are to all that he is, to all that he is. We must have our lives completely yielded to Christ. Now, we see in our text this evening, we see examples of people yielding their lives to Christ. We see that with the leper. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But just before that, I want us to consider examples not only just here in our passage but perhaps even in the gospels in general of people coming to jesus uh, in a way which is kind of um it's not yielding their lives to him but actually in a sense kind of using him to get what they want from him using him to get what they want from him uh, we see in our passage interestingly it's um when jesus goes out and he prays in verse 35, we see him praying for the Father. And then it says in verse 36, and Simon and those who were with him searched for him. Simon and those that were with him searched for him. And when they had found him, they said to him, everyone's looking for you. Everyone's looking for you. Now that can sound like just an innocent comment, a very, uh, you know, just a, an innocent uh, thing to say. And what was Jesus' response? He said in verse 38, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. This idea of every of um, uh, Peter and the disciples and those who were with him coming to Christ and saying, "Where have you been? You know, where where have you been? Everyone's looking for you." There's a sense in which that's a, that's the wrong approach to take before Jesus. Now we see this. The reason why this is important is because. We see this idea throughout the Gospels take shape. We see this happen in other areas of Scripture. People coming to Jesus, almost in a sense, so that they can so, so that they can get something from Him. Not coming to Him to give them to give Him their lives, but coming to Him to take something from Him. And this is very often, um, you know, when Jesus heals people, uh, we see it in our uh, account today when He heals the. The man with leprosy he says, "Don't tell anyone." And then he tells him to go and um, and go and uh, declare to the priest. 
But he says, don't tell, don't tell anyone about this healing. Now, why, why does Jesus say that? Why does, he, why does he tell people that he's healed not to tell anyone? Well, I think there's um, a sense in which the, 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 the crowds were getting carried away with the, with the physical uh, miracles that were taking place with the here and now. They wanted Jesus to rescue them as their king. We see this in John chapter 6, uh, when Jesus fed the 5,000. And it said the people came to him in John chapter 6. He said they tried to take him by force to be their king. And it said that Jesus had to depart from them and he went into a place of solitude. He went away to seek the Father's will. You see, Jesus came, and theologically it's referred to as the messianic secret, that he, he came as the Messiah, and he, but he came not just to deliver the Jewish people from the hands of Roman oppression, not just to heal the sick and to cast out demons. Those are all, uh, uh, the, the, the miracles are very, um, you know, they're very, in, they're very important. They fulfill the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. But Jesus came with a mission, and that was to go to the cross. And very often man would come to Jesus and would try to take Jesus and use him for their own means, to use him for their own purposes. And do you know something? We, we very often see this today in, in, in the current culture that we're in. There's many, many people who are sitting in churches with Bibles in their hands, with a prayer on their lips, and they say, yeah, I, I believe, I trust in Jesus as king, Jesus is my king, and they're saying these things, but they've taken Jesus, they've come to him on their terms, and they've taken a Jesus in order to satisfy their requirements, in order to help them with their current circumstances, their situations. Now, I'm not, what I'm not saying is that, I'm not saying Jesus doesn't help his people, what I'm saying here is there are many people who have come to Jesus with their own agendas. They've come to take Jesus as the king in the way that they want him to be king, as opposed to the way that he is the king and reigning and ruling as the king. Let me give you another example. Um, the apostle, um, the, 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 uh, the disciple Peter, the apostle, um, when Jesus was talking about how he would have to go to the cross, you see, he's concentrating on this messianic. Uh, uh, task of the, the atoning work of Calvary. Jesus has fixed his eyes going forth to go and to die on the cross for the sins of his people. And what does Peter say? Peter says, no, you don't, you don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to go to the cross. And what was Jesus' response? He said, Satan, get behind me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but you are mindful of the things of men. And this is the danger. There are lots of professing Christians that are, that are concerned with the things of men and they're not concerned with the things of God. They're not concerned with the things of God. Another example, just, to, just before we come uh, to the next section and just as we close, when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem on the donkey, there were the, 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 people of, the people of Jerusalem, they were laying their clothes down before him. They were her heralding as King Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And here's Jesus, this king who they believe is going to redeem them from the Roman oppression. But you know, just a few days later, many within this same crowd were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. You see, this, this profession of faith that they had was very shallow. It was very man-centered. It was humanistic. And we live in a world today of, a Christ, of the Christian landscape, which is humanistic. It's a world where people are treating Jesus like a, like a get-out-of-jail-free card or some kind of uh, genie in a lamp that's just going to sort out their life and sort out what, how they want to be sorted. They want to they be delivered from the Roman oppression, so Jesus is going to be the one who helps them to do that. And this is the wrong way to come to Christ. And if you've come to Christ in this way, if you've come to Jesus in such a way uh, because you, you want him to just help you out in difficult circumstances or you want him to do something for you. We need to come to Christ for who he is and for what he's done at Calvary. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he must and should be worshipped in the way that he has prescribed to be worshipped. Now let's just, as we come to a close, we'll just look at the, the humility that is needed 
We've spoken about those who have come to Christ in a human, a man-centered way. But let us look at the leper, the, the man with leprosy. In verse 40, now the leper came to him, imploring him, imploring Jesus, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. If you are willing, you can make me clean. And we know that Jesus said he is willing and he cleansed this man with leprosy. But we see this picture here. We see this leper. He, he understands, he recognizes that his desperate condition. He recognizes that without Christ, without this, this leprosy being healed, he is lost. He is dead. He is in a, he is in a sinful, uh, he is in a dangerous uh, condition. We've spoken of, of how this condition is kind of, uh, it has a parallel uh, symbolism of sin. But here this leper comes and he kneels down. This is a, a, a symbol of, of, um, of yielding himself, as bowing his, himself down before the Lord. And he implores him. He's imploring him. He's crying out to Jesus. This is a sense of, it gives us a picture of desperation. Have we, re have we come to Christ with this desperation? Have we come to Christ on his terms, bending the knee before him as Lord and King? And then he says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. You see, he trusted Christ. If you're willing, you can make me clean. He trusted him. You know, in Luke chapter 5, this same account, it says that the man called him Lord. He cried out, Lord, and he fell at his face. He fell down on his face, imploring him. In Matthew chapter 8, of the same account, it says that the man worshipped him. The man worshipped him. And really what we see here, yes, we see a picture of humility. We see a picture of this man who came to Christ with desperation. But we see the Lord cleanse this man. We see the, the Lord uh, willingly cleanse this man because this man came with a correct motivation. This man came with a brokenness. Now, I just wonder, just as a, uh, just to share with uh, brothers and sisters this evening, I wonder if we come to Jesus in a, in, a, in, a, in a broken way, what I mean by that is, have we come to him with humility in our hearts? Have we come to him recognizing that, that our sin is, is, is going gonna, is gonna to take us away from him for all eternity unless he saves us unless he cleanses us, unless he cleanses us of our sin our sin is going to destroy us the bible says the soul that sinneth will die but the wages of sin is death sin is a very a very serious thing before god now we may say things like oh well it's just uh, it's just a white lie or i did this once or we treat sin very casually but sin is very dangerous. Sin is very damning. And the reason why sin is so serious is not just because what we do, not just, it's not just about what we do, but it's about who we do it against. Let me put it to you like this, just as we come to a close. I, I've got a brother. Uh, I'm not a violent person. I wouldn't do this. But if I, if I punched my brother, we're going to fall out for a few days, and then we're going to make friends, and everything's going to be okay. If I went into the local town and punched a police officer, I'm going to get arrested. If I went to, to court and, and before the judge and I, try, I, I punched the judge, I'm going to get sent to jail. Now, if I went down to London and attempted to punch the queen, I'm probably going to get shot dead on sight by her bodyguard. So the point I'm trying to make is each time it's the same offense. It's just a punch. Each time that the offense is the same, but because of the level of the authority of the one against whom that offense has been committed, the penalty increases. Now, that is why sin is so, is so deadly and sin is, has such a weight of gravity. Because when we sin, we sin against an eternal God, an infinite God who is infinite in his holiness and his purity. You see, God doesn't treat sin lightly. No sin can enter his presence. That's why we talked earlier about the, the need for the righteousness of Jesus. Because when we, when we die, if we, we're going to stand in two conditions before God. We will either stand before God having been clothed in the righteous obedience of Christ, 
having our sin dealt with at the cross of Calvary, and therefore we will be welcomed into glory with him for all eternity of eternities to come. Or the other condition is that we will stand before God looking like ourselves. We'll stand before God looking like that leper with the, with the cloth that is trying to cover the sores and his wounds. All these self-righteous deeds, this Christian veneer, and even within the church, we can have a self-righteous veneer of Christianity and die and go to hell. Folks, we must be born again. We must be born again. We must seek the Lord in a, in a, in a, in a humble way. We see here with this leper a picture of conversion. But even as Christians, you know, you don't just, you don't just get saved and then carry on the rest of your Christian life trying to just, you know, do it all in your own strength and pulling, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps in order to uh, fulfill the rest of the Christian walk in your own, uh, in your own power and your own strength. See, we're saved by God and we must be kept by God. He is the one who saves us and he is the one who keeps us. So a few, a few thoughts this evening. Maybe, maybe you're here. I don't really know. I uh, only really know Maurice. I don't know everyone else here. Maybe you've come for the Savior. Maybe you've been born again. That's brilliant. If that's the case, I would encourage you to keep looking onto Jesus. He's cleansed us, and we must give him our lives. We must, we must worship and serve him. Let's just, um, in, our, in our verse, in our text this evening, it says, when uh, Peter's mother-in-law was healed, um, in verse 31, so he came and he took her by the hand and lifted her up. We see a picture here of conversion of someone who's lifted up by the Lord and immediately the fever left her and it says, what did she do? Verse 31, and she served them. And she served them. Let's be a people who serve the Lord and the King. Let us, let us seek him, not, not in order to be saved, but because he saved us because he saved us. Maybe you're here this evening, maybe you're on the, the call this evening and you haven't experienced this conversion. You haven't experienced the, the, the saving new birth that God gives. I would, I would encourage you to come to Christ, this one who is willing and able, this one who went to the cross of Calvary for the sin of his people. I would encourage you to come to him tonight. Don't put it off any longer. None of us are guaranteed another moment. None of us are guaranteed another heartbeat. You know, in the time that we've been here tonight on, on Zoom together, there's, there's, there's 7,000 people die every hour in this world. And at some point, we're going to go to meet our maker. And this is serious, guys. If you haven't been born again, if you haven't been set free from sin, then that is a very spiritually dangerous place to be in. You've heard the message tonight. And I would encourage you to seek the Lord while he may be found, to call upon him. Well, he is near. Forsake your sin. There's no sin that you're committing that is worth your eternal destiny. These few minutes of pleasure, these few moments of pleasure of sin, do not exchange your eternal soul just for these few temporary moments here on this earth. The Bible says this life is a vapor. It is here one moment and it is gone the next. Jesus Christ is willing, folks. He's willing to cleanse. He's willing to save. Would we come to him, even as Christians, would we come to him, recognize he's willing to grow us in grace, he's willing to cleanse us from sin and from unrighteousness? Let's just pray, shall we, as we, as we close this evening. Father, we thank you that, that you sent your son, Jesus, into this world to save sinners. We thank you, Jesus, that you came willingly, that you went to that cross and you took the cup of the cup of wrath and you drank down every last drop in the face of your people. Lord, we're so sorry for when we come to you and we use you for our own our own gain, for our own advancement of our own kingdoms, Lord. Father, we we apologize and we repent. And we pray that you would be pleased to have our hearts changed this evening, that you would be pleased to mold us and shape us, that we would yield our, our lives to you, that we would come as this leper came to you, Christ, and he bowed his knee before you, 
And he implored you, Lord, and asked you if you are willing then you would clean us, Lord. And we pray that you would cleanse us today, even those of us here that are saved. We pray you would cleanse us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, that you would allow us to put to death the deeds of the flesh by your Spirit, Lord, and that we would grow in nearness to you and conformity to the image of Christ. We do, I do pray for each one of us here, Lord, that there would be something of your word this evening that would, that would have um, really taken root Pray, Lord God, that we wouldn't be hearers only of your word, but that we would be doers, Father, and that we would live for you, that we would get a rise like Peter's mother-in-law, and we would serve you in the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord, that you would guard our hearts and our minds now, cause us to be men and women that would turn from sin and that would turn to you. We love you, Lord, and we trust you. We thank you that you loved us first and that you sent your son to die and Calvary's Hill, that he is the risen Saviour, that he's reigning and ruling at this moment in time. Lord, we commit our lives to you. We pray you would receive all the glory and honour in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been lovely to have the opportunity to share with you, brothers and sisters. And uh, we'll just um, draw to a close, uh, singing our third, our third hymn. Third hymn which is a, a mighty fortress and him <clears throat> a mighty fortress is our god a sure defense and weapon he orders all things for our good frees us from all oppression i think it's that one is that right uh or no it's i think i've got a different version let's just sing the one on the screen anyway I don't know if you want to take over the singing, Maurice. I, I don't know if I've got the melody. Thanks, brother. Yeah, that's all right. Um... Yeah, let's um, let's praise uh, with this hymn. A mighty fortress is our God, a backbone never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ill prevailing. And especially uh, what uh, goes with today's message as well is in uh, stanza number three. Um, we will not fear for God has willed. And as we sing together. And then uh, in the end, I would ask uh, Pastor Shio to give us the benediction after I finish leading the song. A mighty fortress is a God, a backwalk never failing. A helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient form. The seek to work as war, his craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. Oh, nothing's not is equal. Did we in our strength confide? Our striving would be losing. One or the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be. Christ Jesus, it is He. Lord Sabaoth his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with evils feel, should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has will. 
is true to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for Lord his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abided. The Spirit and the gifts are ours, through him who will aside Let goods and kindred go, his mortal life also. The body they make it, God's truth abided still. His kingdom is forever. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Good to be Amen. with you. Good to be with you, brothers and sisters. Yeah, thank you very much, Pete. Yeah, we received so much grace.